Hello, this is Hope, and you're listening to Covert Castaway. Welcome to my weekly diary of what I learn and how I cope with transitioning to life as a liveaboard cruiser. I wanted to understand how a new boat gets built. So we traveled to La Rochelle, France and took a factory tour. Then we got to watch as one of our friends got their boat commissioned. And just like being in labor without an epidural, it's not something you can ever fully prepare for. The birth of a boat is nothing like you would imagine it to be. Originally, when we weighed the pros and cons of buying a built-to-order new boat versus buying a used boat and refitting it, it seemed pretty straightforward. You say, I want this base boat, add this and that, and hand me the keys. Just like buying a car, right? Turns out this is not at all what happens. I want to share my observations now having gone through the tour and seeing our friends go through this. And then later, when we're actually going through this, you can laugh hysterically at the gap between my expectations and reality. Like all serious things in life, I'm not a fan of surprises. So on our annual trip to France to visit my husband's family, we squeezed in a tour of the Fountain Peugeot factory just outside of La Rochelle, France. This is the factory where they build their small vessels between 40 and 50 feet. And assuming nothing major changes, this is where our boat will be conceived from a magical concoction of fiberglass and balsa wood and will come out the other end, fully masted and bathed roughly eight weeks later. But that's just the beginning. Okay, let's break this whole thing down into three trimesters. The first trimester, this is the manufacturing process. This particular factory is laid out to accommodate each progressive step through the building process. There are roughly between 8 and 10 separate stations in the factory working on about that many boats at the same time. One boat comes out of the factory a week. Well, roughly, give or take, with the whole month of August off in France and the holidays and all the other reasons French people take time off. The process all starts with the molds. They're huge. They're double-sided molds which form the deck and cockpit and a single-sided mold for the hull. These things are gigantic, and there's only one boat in them at a time. Try to picture about two or three huge semi-trucks parked next to each other. That's about the size. Once the pieces come out, they're measured and tested to be sure they achieve the right level of resilience. These two major pieces are made of one continuous surface, which ultimately gets fused together with layers of gel coat, fiberglass, and foam. The molds produce about 200 boats, but start to lose fidelity in their shape after that, which is roughly when the builder decides to update the model, because they will need to update the molds anyway. While the molds are doing their thing, the bulkhead pieces are cut to spec separately, while the cabins, kitchens, and the head enclosures are all built and assembled in single units to be installed later. We walk through a field of heads that were just hanging around, ready to be lifted right into the boat. Before the whole piece comes out of the mold, they're lined on the bottom and sides with square blocks of balsa wood cores cut from the strongest pieces of the inner ring of the tree. So imagine a block cutting board. It was explained that each individual balsa block is pre-treated with resin to make sure each block individually is watertight before they are then put into the boat fully sealed in resin, which I'll explain. There's a lot written about balsa wood cores, but do your own research. Personally, I'm a big fan of having a rigid hull, so I'm a fan of balsa wood cores. The hull is then sealed with huge pieces of fiberglass, again, for additional reinforcement, and the thickness is measured for the safety certification. Each end of the holes and partitions are filled with foam cores, as are the inner walls within the holes. So they have pockets of air sealed within the boat. This technique claims to produce unsinkable boats. I'll just knock on balsa wood here and move right along. Once this is done, the entire whole piece is wrapped in a massive plastic bag on the inside and vacuum sealed for resin infusion. The goal is to inject resin into this massive bag to fuse all the fiberglass, wood, and the interior whole structure together to create a homogeneous composite structure. I'm sure it also helps contain the caustic fumes that protect the workers from terrible health issues as well. Resin is precisely measured as it's going in and then as it's coming out to ensure exactly the right amount is being used to get the effect they want. 
The idea is to have each individual small balsa block core water sealed, then have the whole thing sealed as one piece so if there was ever a puncture, any water intrusion would be contained to where the puncture entered and not threaten the surrounding wood. That's why this whole process works this way. After the resin comes out and the big plastic bag comes off, the hole is one solid structural piece at this point. Until I stopped to think about the holes that would later be drilled to accommodate the underwater blue lights that are currently on our commissioning list. I'm still thinking through that. They then slide in the bulkheads, making custom adjustments by hand because nothing that big can come out exactly perfect based on just small, unique characteristics of each boat's resin process. They fiberglass and glue those pieces together as the full resin piece cures. We were able to actually see the watertight sections of the boat and where they were. The next phase is assembly of the hull. They lower the cabins, heads, and the kitchen enclosure as single units into the boat. It sort of reminded me of building the Lego Friends catamaran with my niece. After this, the engine mounts and sail drives are installed, and the electrical network is laid out through a series of plastic pipes between the stern and bow. This is then quickly followed with all the major systems being installed, generator, air conditioning, engines, all that is put into the whole piece while it's open. As this is happening right next to it, the cockpit deck is receiving its lifelines and stanchions. But this next part is really cool, and we got to see this happen while we were there. They have this assembly station where there's a huge lift, and they lift the deck and cockpit section above the hull section and lower it down. In just a few minutes, it finally becomes a boat. After this point, the electrical continues along with the installation of winches and major finishing work. It was also good to be able to look under the hull on a finished boat out of the water. Since at all the boat shows, you never get this viewpoint. The boats then get moved into a separate area with a testing pool where they test the engine, the AC, look for any issues or possible leaks. Okay, sidebar on the factory itself. Fountain Peugeot has an impressive operation and we didn't have any major concerns coming out of our tour of how the boat was manufactured. The place was spotless. Well, unless of course we arrived the day after the cleaning people came. But seriously, not a speck of dust. While it's pretty low tech, you know, there's not like robots walking around or anything like that. The workstation areas were extremely well organized and safe, and everyone was wearing their protective eyewear. Workflow was well mapped out, and you could understand just by looking at the work charts what the quality control process was. Even if I don't read French, it was pretty clear what they were looking for. There's a series of about 20 quality control categories, checked by maybe a dozen different people through the course of the manufacturing line. All the 20 or so categories of systems on the boat are checked and rechecked at different times in the process, which is pretty reassuring. Okay, this is when the second trimester begins. Masting, final inspection, dealer handover, and commissioning. It takes about 10 working days for the factory to get the boat from the factory site to the La Rochelle port, which is about only a 30 minute drive. Most of that time is waiting around for the window of time for the transport vehicle to be available, which is done through a third party. Because the boats are so big and wide, this is definitely not a ride without peril. The roads through La Rochelle itself match its charming age. It became an established port town in the 12th century, so hopefully you get the idea. The final inspection and masting stage is interesting, and I definitely learned a lot. The boat is put on blocks where it enjoys its whole treatment. Then it gets lowered into the water where a couple of crews overlap. While the boat is going through its final inspection and the mast is getting put up as well as the standing rigging by one crew with blue marking tape, a second crew is receiving and inspecting the boat with yellow marking tape. Officially, this is when an owner has two to three days to inspect the boat and officially have it handed over. Notice I never mentioned the owner at this point. Based on the contract, the owner is to receive and inspect the boat, but what actually happens is the broker receives it on your behalf, unless you know the exact date your boat's being transported and lifted into the water in time to book a flight, you know, to be there when it happens. Instead, it would be the broker's agent, who, in reality, at the time we saw this happening, was the commissioning company contracted by a broker to do the work. You heard that right. It's not the owner, and it's not the broker who's approving the final handover from the factory which is a bit unsettling. 
because officially, this is when you're considered the owner of the boat and when your warranty kicks in. It's also the day you need to have an insurance policy. When you take delivery of a new car, you show up at the lot, you get a chance to go over anything and make sure it's what you wanted, then you sign the final paperwork and you get the keys. This is not what happens here. I'll say the commissioning agent, the guys with the yellow tape, they do take 100 photos and go through their own quality control process, which appears to be fairly manageable. They also assured us, which was consistent with what we were told from the factory, that the boat doesn't leave the spot free of blue or yellow tape with anything undone that's important. We've heard of things being missed or not installed properly in this awkward in-between state, so it would be important to be there in person, I think, to look at everything. Though we had heard of important examples, like through holes being cut in the hole for installations of things, then filled because someone decided they were in the wrong place, but the final gel coat work maybe wasn't done properly before the boat gets put in the water. This kind of thing you would never really know until you hauled it out. It's not like you're ripping off paneling at this point to look for things like this. Other stories we heard about was people in the boatyard putting the boat keels on blocks so someone could treat the hole, but because the weight isn't distributed properly, it cracks the keels. Again, the owners never knew this until they did a haul out and saw water streaming out of the deep cracks in their keels to find out it had been a pattern. This is the stuff of nightmares. Okay, so the boat's in the water, the mast is up, the blue and yellow tape is gone, and the boat's now ready for commissioning. And I've got to say, Understanding the process of commissioning is as elusive as trying to photograph a unicorn. We are planning to take delivery in France, but other people take delivery with their dealer in the States after they have had their boat either captain across or shipped via freight. Yes, a ship can be shipped on a container ship. Say that five times fast. If you do commissioning in France, they say it's about two weeks. If you have it shipped or sailed, there's that two weeks Then, there's another four to five weeks in the U.S., according to our broker. But if you think about this math, that's four to five weeks of work that isn't accounted for for the people picking up in France. So I'm just going to go ahead and plan for six weeks commissioning in La Rochelle. Our broker will be managing the planning and operations of our boat, working with the local commissioning agent on the ground, as I mentioned before. As of this podcast, our broker has boots on the ground to manage the process in person. I understand that this is the second person now on the ground with the broker's logo on their shirt. So hopefully that will be fully in place by the time our boat is ex-factory as well. Everything between the factory, the broker, and the commissioning agent is tracked based on the whole number, which is when all the fun really starts for a new boat owner anyway. We don't have one yet. At this point, they do all the basic commissioning They put mattresses in, install appliances, and things like rigging, windlass, navigation systems, furler, bowsprit, davits for your dinghy, and anything else us crazy people who live aboard decide we can't live without. You know, like line cutters and fancy props or dive compressors, combo washers and dryers, and yes, even dishwashers, if that's what your heart desires. I want to take you down a quick little scenic route. In an earlier podcast, I explained a bit about the French sailing culture. Simple and minimalist. As these catamarans have grown in popularity, there's been a whole cottage industry that has sprung up and bolstered business of boat brokers for after-sales commissioning. Why? Because people buy boats and don't want simple and minimalistic. They want things like biminis, ice makers, and full laundry facilities, and all the things that we're used to having at home as red-blooded consumers. Not proud about it, it's just the way it is. So with catamaran popularity going up, and sad to say, Hurricanes damaging so many boats in the BVIs, and just last week as I record this in the Bahamas, people are putting deposits down to get in the production queue before their insurance claims are even processed. So all this is well and good, but more people like us are saying, I'll just pick up the boat in Europe. There's a lot of boat builders there, so Fountain Peugeot isn't the only one. And I'll cruise the med the first season as we do the shakeout. So this is sort of becoming a trend. The problem is the local commissioning companies aren't set up for this kind of scale, with access to the range of suppliers and even talent available for things like custom electrical systems, etc., which is actually great if you're a young man or a woman who is a badass boat technician. The sky's the limit for you, and even the lucky ones sometimes get offered jobs as first-year captains on private boats for the shakeout work. Anyway, the commissioning agents are often not only commissioning for one boat a week, I mentioned being produced by Fountain Peugeot in our case. They often commission for multiple brokers and even multiple boat factories. These guys have a scaling problem, 
and they're trying to transform while managing all this work. You know, like getting modern IT systems versus using paper methods to run the operation. It might also be the first time they implement a request on a new model, and it potentially has implications like in the installation. For instance, lithium. Even though in the States or other countries it might be clear where to get the batteries and how to set up the systems with the right amount of solar, this is a relatively new thing out of France, and a whole lot could go wrong if it's not all sourced and installed properly as a whole system. Then there's the cultural and language barrier. That's a whole separate podcast in the future, but suffice it to say, even if you speak French, there is so much room for error just because the change requests go through more than one line of communication when someone halfway across the globe is on a different time zone. Okay, so back to the point. We saw some friends getting their boat commissioned while we were in France on this same trip. We got to see a lot firsthand, and I won't get specific about the issues out of respect for the innocent. However, because of all these scalability issues, I think it's important to properly plan for and anticipate problems that go along with any custom request, or try to avoid as many crazy customized changes as possible, and assume nothing and document everything. I think it would be generally in a buyer's best interest to assume and really look for problems at major stages of handover, from the factory to the commissioning agent leading up to the boat being put in the water. This is where the big problems can be identified early, again, assuming you know what you're looking for. Another thing we decided was not to get the boat during crunch time, which is July. Avoid June and July leading up to August summer vacation altogether if it's possible. We decide it's better to allow more time than less and not be in a big hurry. We might be freezing to death in February in La Rochelle, but better that than be stuck and miss a whole season because everyone up and left for holiday before your mast was up. Which brings us to the third trimester of boat pregnancy. I know you thought that handover and delivery was probably what it is, but actually it's not. This phase of the boat birthing process includes chandlery, provisioning, and shakeout. For some, it takes the whole season. Chandlery and provisioning, especially if you're picking up your boat in another country, it's pretty straightforward. Keep it simple and shop local. Use Amazon or pick things up along the way for everything else. In the local stores and chandleries in the boat yard, we saw everything you could possibly imagine, from dishes with rubber on the bottom, linens, folding bikes, appliances, gear, line, weather gear, repair equipment, buoys, charts, dinghies, anything you can think of that goes on a boat. Nearby, there was this huge store, like our Target or Walmart, and it's Europe, so they have Ikeas like we have Starbucks. Sure, creature comforts are awesome, but are they worth the $5,000 or so to ship a container? I'm just not sold on that yet. I think a person could literally walk off a plane with two suitcases and stock everything else from the boatyard and a trip to a couple stores with a rental van. In terms of exchange rates and cost, it is what it is. Electronics seem to be high, but everything else is a wash if you compare exchange rates versus the cost of shipping from the U.S. It's really the shakeout, though, that's treacherous. Not for your safety so much as your nerves. Well, actually, it could be safety if you have a major issue, like steering failure or electrical problems. I'll put an asterisk here. Had we known when we put our second deposit down what we know now about the adventures of shaking out a new boat. I can't for sure say that we would have opted to buy a new boat. I'm not regretting it now. I'm just not sure. Although I have a little weakness for that new boat smell. Based on what I've heard from new owners, I think it's pretty safe to say that everything that will break badly will happen the first year, which is at least when everything is still covered under warranty. And it's not just Fountain Peugeot. It's all boat builders. They all have the same problem with new boats. So that's the bright side. My point is don't underestimate what's involved in the shakedown, which is why I reserved it as part of this whole separate trimester that might go for a while, like it was when I was pregnant with my daughter. She was two weeks late, and I was in labor for three days. I was completely done being pregnant, and the pain felt like it would never end. It's kind of like that. That's when I came to this realization that birthing a new boat is more like doing a major home remodel. It's not like suddenly done. There's a lingering punch list that goes months after your general contractor takes his crew to the next house and you're crossing your fingers they show up to redo the work they got wrong the first time. It's just how it works. So the biggest lesson I learned through the factory visit, the broker visit, and the commissioning agent visit, and also seeing our friends, is it's really important to manage your own expectations. 
I think you have to go in with the mindset that yes, it's an amazing milestone, an incredible point in time as you launch into your new liveaboard life. But like pregnancy and labor, it's a magical experience and absolutely life-changing, but some parts of it just really are going to suck. I'll leave you with this. My grandparents were married over 70 years before they both passed away. My grandfather could be a real pain in the butt. He was so ornery. I asked my grandmother once how she was able to be married to him and be happy. And she said to me, Oh, honey, the secret to happiness is through the bad times, you just have to keep lowering your expectations, which is actually brilliant advice. What about you? What have you learned in your boat buying or commissioning process? Please visit the Covert Cast Suite Facebook page and join the conversation. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please subscribe, like, or share with another Covert Castaway. Fair winds for now. Bye.